more tech, I'm convinced that electrical accessories are here to stay. You won't get any argument from me, Van. I know that the guy who's up to snuff an electrical troubleshooting is bound to have a bright future. I don't see how he can miss. The radio, automatic beam changer, and mirrormatic mirror, for instance, are three of our most popular accessories. I really think we'd better brush up on how to service them as of now. That sounds okay in theory, Van, but doesn't that kind of work call for a specialist? Not necessarily, Ward. There is a lot that any technician can do. Even you, my boy. I'll buy that, Tech. Take the new transistor-powered radio as a starter. You know the changes that using a transistor brought about, don't you? Well, uh, it took the place of the vibrator, didn't it? That's one change, sure. The transistor also did away with output tubes, the rectifier tube, and the power supply transformer. In addition, only 12 volts are needed to operate tubes, resistors, and condensers in a transistor-powered set. This adds a lot of extra service life to these parts. Only 12 volts? How many volts does a vibrator type set require? The tubes of a vibrator set need 200 volts. So the tubes and other components involved have a shorter service life. As you can see, Ward, since the circuit of a transistor-powered set uses lower voltage, parts last longer. The transistor itself, by the way, has an almost infinite service life. Sounds like a real advantage, all right. That it is, Ward. But remember, a voltage drop of only one volt in a 12-volt transistor circuit is almost 10%. As a result, the antenna trimmer and push-button adjustments are more critical. In the 200-volt circuit of a vibrator set, a one-volt drop is only a half percent. That gives you more leeway in making antenna trimmer and push-button adjustments. Maybe we've gotten into a bad habit by not paying enough attention to trimmer adjustment. So be sure to adjust the antenna trimmer prior to delivery, after radio or antenna repair, and in cases of questionable reception. Always check it on dual antennas, where it is especially critical. You'd still begin that adjustment by getting the car in a location fairly free from outside radio interference, right? Yeah, Ward. And run the antenna up as far as she will go. Warm up the radio for at least 15 minutes. Then tune into a weak station above a thousand kilocycles, one you can hardly hear with the volume turned on full. Or tune off station where you get noise. Back off the antenna trimmer adjusting screw. Then turn it clockwise to get maximum volume from either the weak station or the noisy point off station. Making the final turn clockwise helps ensure that the adjustment will not change. Again, this adjustment on dual antenna sets is most important. Next thing to do is adjust the push buttons for best reception on the local stations available. Okay, Van. I certainly know how to do that. But fixing a radio that doesn't play or one that's noisy, well, it kind of throws me. Well, that's understandable. So we're going to review the things you or any technician can do. You'll be surprised at how many complaints you can correct, and the customer won't ride around with a hole in the instrument panel. Now, to help you check out any set, you don't need to understand electronics. All you need are parts you know are good and can substitute easily. A spare fuse, an antenna assembly, a speaker, a set of tubes, and three condensers or suppressors. Notice that these test parts are taped. That's to keep you from leaving them in some owner's set. You've heard about a hospital operation where the sponge was found missing. <laughs> I don't need a brick wall to fall on me. Any other tips? Well, if the radio doesn't play at all, turn it on and off a few times. If you don't hear a pop in the speaker, disconnect the battery lead and install a new fuse. If switching the set off and on still doesn't produce noise, see if 12 volts are available at the fuse receptacle. Wait a second, Van. Won't the pilot light tell you if the fuse and lead are okay? On some models, the pilot light is fed by a separate lead. So in those cases, it won't tell you. Tech's right. Now, if you find ample voltage at the fuse receptacle and the new fuse blows, the set needs major work by a competent radio man who has more test equipment. But if you get sound through the speaker and the set still won't play, connect your test antenna. Hold the antenna so it sticks out and away from the car. If the radio plays then, you know the difficulty is with the original antenna. 
but make sure you're not throwing a good antenna away. See if the antenna connector is clean and makes a good connection. Don't throw power antennas away. Parts are available, so repair them. Sometimes cleaning or straightening a bent mast is all that's needed. Good advice, Tech. Now, if the antenna's okay, suspect the speaker next. A car with a rear seat speaker is especially easy to check. Turn the fader control counterclockwise to test the front speaker, clockwise to check the rear speaker. If one works and the other doesn't, you'll know the set's okay, but one speaker is dead. On cars without a rear speaker, connect your spare speaker in place of the original speaker. If the radio plays, replace the old speaker. But if you find that the speaker isn't at fault, check the tubes. Remove the set and substitute tubes from your pre-tested collection. The ones marked with tape, huh? Those are the babies. And put them in one at a time. Give each tube enough warm-up time before you make the next switch. Whenever you remove the radio to do that, ground the set to the battery's negative terminal and connect the battery lead to the positive post. Otherwise, you're apt to ruin the whole set. Never operate the radio without a speaker. The speaker's a vital part of the circuit. Bypassing it can cause serious damage. Okay, Van, I'll watch it. Suppose the radio still doesn't play after we try all the tubes. Well, then the correction is too involved for us to handle. The radio specialist will have to track it down. Well, how about replacing the transistor? Keep your hands off that transistor. Checking it and replacing it is a job strictly for a radio man. tex has got a good point. Now, so far, we've covered the importance of push button and antenna trimmer adjustments. We've also explained troubleshooting a radio by substituting antenna, speaker, and tubes. Let's look into an owner report of noisy or erratic reception. If antenna trimmer and push button adjustments don't correct a noise condition, find out when the noise takes place. What do you mean, when it takes place? Well, does it happen when the car is parked and the engine's not running? When the car is parked and the engine is running? Or does it show up only when the car is out on the road? Here's an example. If the radio is noisy when the car is parked and the engine's not running, tune in a local station. Then jar the instrument panel with the heel of your hand. If jarring causes more noise, there's probably a loose connection someplace. To track down a loose connection, wiggle the speaker connections and the antenna connector. Make sure the set doesn't have a loose mounting which would cause a poor ground. Yeah, Ward, and if none of those are loose, but you still get noise when you jar the set, remove it and hook it up on the bench. Then, with your fingertip, gently tap each tube. Like this? That's right. Now, if you hear noise when any tube is tapped, it's probably defective and should be replaced. But if tubes are okay and there is still noisy reception, get the set over to the radio man. Atta boy, man. And please excuse the interruption. But this record is at its turning point. Here's something else you'll find. If reception is okay when the engine isn't running, but is noisy when the engine does run, you should suspect the car's electrical system. To check this, latch the hood securely, start the engine, turn the radio on and tune it to a spot between stations. That gives you pure noise and you can study it better. Ignition noise shows up on the radio as a ticking sound and it'll vary in frequency with engine speed. If you hear ignition noise, Ward, check condenser connections at the ignition coil. They must be clean and tight. If connections are okay, try a new condenser and see if the noise disappears. If your test condenser doesn't correct ignition noise, a loose high tension wire is the most common cause. So check connections at the distributor cap, coil, and spark plug terminals. If these are okay, check the secondary cables for continuity. A poor radio ground can also let ignition noise into the radio. So check the antenna connection at the receiver. Check the ground between the radio mounting and instrument panel too. The antenna mounting nut also should be tight. Now, generator noise begins as a low-pitched whine at low speeds. As speed increases, the noise gradually increases to a high-pitched whine. 
If replacing the generator condenser doesn't eliminate the noise, inspect the brushes and commutator. If there is abnormal arcing, the brushes may not be seating properly. If they are worn, replace them and clean the commutator if it's dirty. In extreme cases, turn down the commutator and undercut the segment insulators. Then you can install new brushes, sanding them in for full contact. Very clear, Van. How about the condenser at the regulator? Well, if the regulator condenser is bad or has a poor connection, it may cause a loud click or buzzing sound when the regulator operates. Okay, I get the idea. Good. Now, suppose there's radio noise when the car is in motion and you've made all the checks we've covered so far. In a case like this, check the ball tip on the antenna. Like a tiny lightning rod in reverse, it takes static picked up by the car and lets it leak off into the air. If the ball is missing, static will discharge from the antenna with a snap that sounds like outside interference. So replace the ball if it's been broken off. Here's another check. Extend the antenna. Flex it slightly to make it vibrate. If that causes noise, check the lead-in. Make sure the antenna mounting and ground are okay. And when checking dual rear antennas, see that insulators haven't worked out of position, causing noise. Here's something else. Loud clicks or pops when you run the turn signals, hit the brakes, or operate power seats and windows mean poor ground connections at those accessories. Some noise, of course, is normal. Good point, Tech. About all we haven't touched on is garbled sound that can't be corrected by antenna trimmer or push-button adjustments. Is that another place to use the spare speaker? Right. Substitute the speaker. If it corrects the sound distortion, check the mounting of the original speaker. The voice coil can be misaligned if the speaker frame is twisted by improper mounting in the grill. If the spare speaker doesn't correct garbled sound, substitute tubes. A defective tube can distort sound, too. I get the picture. Okay. There are more service tips on the touch tuner foot switch and power antenna in this reference book, Ward. Run an eye over it when you can. I'll do that, Tech. Sounds like a real big help. Speaking of help, owners of the new automatic beam changer might need an occasional hand. You understand how it works? Let's see if I do, Van. It automatically dims headlights when it sees an oncoming car and resets them to bright when the car passes. But stepping on the dimmer switch will change the beam manually at any time. That's right. And this knob at the rear of the scanner unit lets you adjust sensitivity. Clockwise increases sensitivity, counterclockwise decreases it. The scanner must be adjusted to see straight ahead. It should not look up or down too much. To check this alignment, be sure the car's on a level floor, like in the headlight aiming bay. Tires must be inflated properly. Front suspension height must be right, and only your own weight in the car. Mount this special aiming tool on the scanner. Loosen the base lock screw just enough to allow free movement. Adjust until the leading edge of each bubble is at zero. Then tighten the lock screw. Side to side adjustment is also important. Some dimming from reflected light is normal, especially on curves when headlights reflect from a bright surface close to the road. Too much sensitivity to reflected side light, though, is annoying. Yeah, Ward, you can check side to side alignment by putting headlights on high beam. If reflected light causes them to dim, decrease scanner sensitivity. Stand about 10 feet ahead of the car, off to one side. Aim a flashlight at the scanner. Walk across toward the other side. When the headlights dim, mark that point on the floor. Repeat that operation from the opposite side. Midpoint between marks should be directly ahead of the scanner. If not, drill two new holes in the instrument panel so the scanner can be relocated. Pretty neat, Van. Anything else? Well, if the dimmer goes bright when it should go dim, and vice versa, Check wiring at the connectors. The green wire must always be in the center. Switch the red and black wires if dimmer goes bright when it shouldn't. Say, I've got a hunch Ward can use some service hints on the new Miramatic mirror along about now. Oh, yeah. 
the heart of the Miramatic, of course, is a tiny photoelectric cell. It sees through a small opening in the mirror. When annoying glare from behind strikes the photocell, it changes current flow in the circuit. That, in turn, causes a tiny amplifier to activate a solenoid. The solenoid attracts an armature attached to the prismatic type mirror, tipping it forward at the top. Presto, glare is directed overhead. Dim, no glare reflection is there instead. When glare behind the driver goes away, the mirror automatically repositions. This three-way switch lets the driver control sensitivity. City gives reduced sensitivity, so reaction to street lighting is minimized. Highway provides increased sensitivity to glare when it's needed most. Off locks the mirror in daylight position. Sensitivity can also be adjusted internally. Once the mirror assembly is out of its case, turn it over. You'll see two small potentiometers. One's marked H, the other C. For a highway and city, no doubt. Right. With a toothpick, turn the arm, as marked by the arrow, to increase sensitivity. The other way decreases sensitivity. Never use a lead pencil. Carbon from the lead can upset the resistance calibration. Looks like a useful accessory. I'll bet customers like it. They do, and will, as long as we keep it shipshape. So if an owner reports that it doesn't operate, first check the fuse. If it's blown, check for a short in the wire leading to the mirror. Check the wire at the panel grommet. One of the prongs might have poked through the insulation. Yeah, and you can bend those prongs to prevent a short at that point. Tape any breaks you find in the insulation and replace the fuse. Put the headlight switch on and touch the lead to the power source. If the fuse blows, replace the mirror assembly. Suppose the fuse doesn't blow, but the mirror still doesn't work. Well, in that case, replace the tube with a new 12K5. Move the mirror switch to highway and let the unit warm up for 30 seconds. If it doesn't work, replace the mirror assembly. Uh, further service tips on vibration no action or erratic action are covered in this reference book, Ward. Make it your service Bible. I sure will, Tech, and thanks. Mad a boy. And right after this meeting, practice up on those tips we've talked about. They'll make accessory service easier and keep our owners happier with our work. <laughs>